Hi, my name is Lea Goldman and I'm really honored to have this great show with Sarah Martin and I hope that everyone will enjoy it. Uh, there are several projects in this show that I prepared. One is the painting and I call the painting Gathering Sparks. Then I have prints and the prints I call um, diminutive fables. Um, there is a project that I did in collaboration with the calligraphy and binder, and I call it Afternoon Hours. And another project is a big number of collages that I just titled them as I see it. Uh, the, the paintings are um, gr grouped in uh, by subject. But the overall title is Gathering Sparks. Now, fortunately for me, my friend Douglas Simon agreed to make the research on the title because there is a great significance to the word. And he will, I asked him to tell about it and he agreed to do it. And I'm really, really grateful to do it. Would you please come and leave your stage? Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. As Leah said, my name is Douglas Simmons, and I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a little qualified for this. I have six published books, and and I've been a scholar studying my own uh, spiritual attitude about the world for some time. So it's a great honor to introduce gathering the sparks, a gathering of sparks, and and the artist Leah. Paintings in this particular exhibit are a portion of more than 50 works, which comprise the body of oil paintings collectively titled Gathering Sparks. And they depict in dynamic metaphysical imagery the message spoken of in the words by scholar Isaac Luria in his detailed philosophy, The Redemptive Universe. And the symbolism of his Gathering Sparks, his idea was that in the creation of the universe, that, that, the creation process itself was somehow shattered and, and sparks of goodness were scattered and hidden in the darkness all about. And his idea is, is that we live in a redemptive universe which can we, can we can act to restore to the original intended perfection it was supposed to have. And there's no, there's no single particle or atom or sphere of existence that does not contain these creative sparks of goodness in our world. And in light of our universal consciousness, each atom is a spark of perfection. And so if gathered together in one place, we could restore the universe to the proper order it was intended to have. And, and in his cosmology, known as the shattering of vessels, we find chaos and astonishment and confoundedness. And he developed this cosmology from, from the opening lines of a book which said, and the earth was empty and without form, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And this primordial chaos was viewed by Luria as a situation, and, and, and I explained that, of how the vessels of creation were broken. And the deep is an allusion to death. And along with the chaos, however, there was emptiness, which to, to scholar Luria implied that there were other vessels waiting to receive the, this, this light, this goodness. So the emptiness, therefore, represents the potential of his universe of rec rectification. And so our task, according to scholar Luria, was to gather up all the goodness we could find and return it to its rightful place at the metaphysical, allegorical center of the universe, not an actual place. And the way we do that is through acts of loving kindness, of being in harmony with the universe, and through higher awareness, which we try to... The ramifications of this philosophy are enormous. In each moment of existence, we have the potential to, to be creative and do good works. And, Anyone who's unaware of this ability or, or spiritually asleep, we won't accomplish much because this, this is done by consciousness itself. So our opportunities are boundless and the choices we make in our activities, 
the interactions we have with our families, friends, neighbors, associates, and even strangers, the way we spend our leisure time, related to food, everything in our daily life represents opportunities to, to strive to be more consciously aware and mindful. And scholar E. Stanley Jones expressed in, in, in quite succinctly the concept of, of Leah Goldman's whole project here. Having the spirit of love within results in a certain quality of being. Thus, this gathering of sparks isn't just a gathering of art, a splash of oil on canvas. This body of art is the fruit of a lifetime spent sowing acts of loving kindness, being in harmony with the universe, and seeking higher awareness. This, this body of work is the harvest of the spirit of the artist, Leah Coleman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Thanks a lot. So to start with, is uh, it's a triptych about storytelling. I'm a storyteller. And actually, the paintings themselves are pages of storybooks, only on a great uh, format. And there's no sequential uh, thinking in our presentation in those paintings. It has a story there, and the viewer can figure out what happened before and what happened after. But all in all, those are all kinds of storybook pages which are right there at that moment and open to interpretation. Um, here, this group is about social concerns and the way I see them, uh, not very violent or worrisome, but still, I hope that the message comes through. But this, this painting is conspiracy. And you can see all this activity that goes on among those characters. Political argument, as you see. This is a um, renegade. See all the wonderful, kind people promise him glory and uh, recognition if he just becomes a warrior. And uh, poor boy, all he wants to do is be with his little dog and just enjoy his life, his way. A dark flag is looming there. That's kind of an experience we sometimes feel. I wanted to do this painting as um, kind of a rem reminiscent of uh, medieval times. And the woman is kind of a medieval character. I called it dance anyway, because look, the, there are so many things to worry about. And all we have left to do is just keep on living, dance anyway. These three paintings are about animals. And my concern about what animals are going through, what we humans make them to. This is a mother bear, and her little bears are mentioned above. And I feel that it was sort of degrading to this animal. Here's this cold person just teaches her how to be a clown, which is so, she's so far from being a clown. I just made her eye to look out and communicate with you, maybe. I was very touched when I was told that wolves in Alaska are caught by helicopters. And that was a painful moment for me to realize. I made this story, because I'm a storyteller, uh, with the Red Riding Hood and her grandmother, and the beautiful garden, and then the sad story of a wolf who has no chance because he is caught by a helicopter. 
it, this week, my concern is of afterlife. You know, I'm getting closer and closer to there. I'm already more than 80 years old. And of course, like everybody else, things like that preoccupy me. And I kind of image, just think about imagery. I think about angels welcoming me. I want to make it a story, of course. And the boat is a symbol of voyage, my voyage. Where will I go? What happened? What will happen to me? What will I turn into? But that's just kind of a sitting there and thinking about those things. A positive statement. I just kind of based it on Psalms 23, God will lead me by still waters, and everything that happened around, but that the, the sense of, a certain sense of security that I am protected and I'm carried by safety and goodness and peace. I describe here the sound of om, no om, and then, then the vision of the end of time of Isaiah, and the whole painting is a sort of a meditating on the sound of om, getting silent. This is a picture of worry. Sometimes we just worry. Things that may not happen or happen, there's so much to say about just sitting there and worrying. I, I painted these tones and these images of worrying and the weeds, even though we like to smile. This is Isaiah's vision of the end of time, when he says that the wolf will live with the sheep and the bull will live with the tiger and a little boy will leave them. This, I, I was influenced here, was influenced by uh, Mexican art, South American imagery. Here I made uh, those, the, the, the thought of pottery, the pottery I was thinking about, and the inspiration of the maker making pots. And that's a wonderful feeling when you create something and you feel that the whole environment is with you. That's a wonderful meaning. This project is uh, called, I call it Afternoon Hours, because I was thinking about thoughts and feelings that I experienced at the last chapter of my life. I did those uh, poems with a poetry group that was uh, directed by Mark Amato, uh, and uh, every uh, I created collages, one by twelve collages, and every collage kind of brought up a poem. Now, once I, I was done with the collages, I didn't know what to do with them, how to combine the poetry with the uh, collages. Fortunately for me, my good friend. Um, Anne Binder, who is a you know, tremendous calligrapher, she agreed to complement my work with her creation and put my poems calligraphically here. And this came out to be such an extraordinary project. It's created in diptych. Here is the imagery. The poem is here. Uh, Anne Binder also did this background here that sort of echoes my kind of imagery and she rearranged the poem in her own creative knowledge. I've done about 28 images on linoleum blocks and uh, there was a problem to print those li linoleum blocks through the conventional press. So uh, lucky for me, the time that I created those, Alan Larkin was there, the Professor Alan Larkin, and he at that time was the head of the printmaking department in the in IU, Indiana University. 
And he said, he offered me to print those in, in his own atelier. And of course, I was delighted that he agreed to do that. And he figured out that the best way to print them is by hydraulic print that goes from up, down. And by doing that, the very beautiful dark areas came clear. And the difficult challenge of these very thin lines came out well and is very clear depicted in every one of the work. Uh, we decided to do an edition of 20, limited edition of 20. And I am very grateful for Alan Larkin for doing this wonderful job for me. My last project would be uh, a, a group of, a big group of collages. Actually, I have endless collages and they come about constantly. Uh, but I presented to the museum about 51, which could be sorted out. Um, the way I do it, I play with cuts and images and background, and I uh, kind of, it's a playful thing. And once there's a story come about, there's a title of the painting was born, and I'm using most of the images later on to paint them on a large scale, but they, that's where they begin usually. And uh, every one of them is different because uh, the materials that I was playing with and was waiting for the meaning to come out. For instance, here is regrets. And here would be the same one that, that I painted later on, uh, worry, um, rejection, um, let me see what else could be. Suspicion. We don't know one another hero, which was the thought about the renegade. The last fox in town. And it goes on and on. And uh, there will be titles by the works and to, to correspond with the image. And I guess it will bring out the meaning of my project. Well, I believe I covered all the things I showed, and I am very, very grateful to the museum, Southern Museum of Art, for giving me the opportunity. I am very grateful for the Museum of Art for supporting me for so many years and uh, having me at the sideline and other activities. Thank you very much and I hope you will enjoy my show. Thank you. Okay. You want me to do the, the shake first? Like, I'm Sarah Martin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, I'm Sarah Martin. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm Sarah Martin. I'm from Murray, Kentucky. I run the woodworking program at Murray State University. Um, and I have been woodworking and making artwork since 1998 when I first took a class at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I started as a metalsmith. I knew that I wanted to make things that weren't images. I wanted to make objects um, and took a wood class as a supplement to my, uh, my metalworking. And after about a minute of woodworking, realized that it was the thing that I needed to do with my entire life and have been doing it ever since. So um, my practice is pretty multidisciplinary as a result. I like to integrate as many different materials as possible into my work. And I think you'll see an example of that in all of the work that's in this show. So this is Upward Mobility. Um, it is a wall cabinet with three compartments that I made based off of um, a swarm of cicadas, like 17 year cicadas that had come out in masses. So when the swarm first started, I would walk down the street and there would be, I don't know, a dozen laying there. They had fallen on their backs and I would bend down and flip them over and say, it's a shame you've been working underground for 17 years to fail because you fell over, because you fell off of a plant and you're on your back. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip you over again. 
Um, except that after about a week of this, no, more like a month, after about a month of this, because there were millions of them, I got a little tired of flipping over bugs and they stopped being quite so precious. But it just struck me as so sad that something could wait that long and, and not succeed because of circumstance. And it reminded me at the time, uh, it was in 2008 during the housing bubble, uh, of how hard you can work sometimes to succeed as an artist and how all of the effort that you put in doesn't necessarily mean success, success, monetary success especially, um, because life happens and you have to contend with reality. So upward mobility is sort of a, an example of what that struggle to be an artist is like or to succeed as an artist. So the lower sections are cicadas underground. Here they are building ladders and then climbing their ladders and, you know, helping one another. That's a, that's a huge thing. And probably my favorite thing about the art community is that um, we work really hard towards one another's mutual success. Um, and there's a kind of generosity there. But a lot of people try, and very few people get to the point where they can, you know, hit this level of success where they can check their coat, which are, of course, their shells in this case, and then go to this crazy party where everything is gold, you know, and you wear a striped shirt because you're French, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so there's sort of various levels of effort um, exemplifying what life as an artist is like. So. so this is Lost and Found. It is a cabinet that I actually have spent a, a ridiculous amount of time working on. Um, I find within my own practice that um, things have to gestate for long periods of time. It doesn't tend to happen spontaneously. When it does, the work is extremely different, and you'll see some of that in some of these other pieces, but the cabinet work tends to be really contemplative and take a lot of time. Um, so this cabinet actually had, has had four or five sets of contents before settling on this. Um, when I was very small, I fell off of a dock and nearly drowned and have had a kind of mortal fascination and dread of the water ever since. Um, and I'm also really, really like obsessed with the Kate Bush album, Hounds of Love. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but the B side of it is entirely, uh, it's a, a musical piece called The Ninth Wave. And it's just songs about people drowning, essentially. Um, and I was trying my very best to communicate in this piece what Kate Bush can do in a two minute song, which She's Kate Bush, I'll never do it, but this is as close as I could get. So this is Lost and Found. I wanted the idea to be that there was this scale shift happening so that the world around you is this extremely big thing that you can't necessarily get yourself around. And so there's this sweet little boat right here that is empty, you know, something has been lost and maybe it's also the thing that is found, but not the person who would have been in it or people. Um, similarly, also, the drawers are intended to be a, a sort of an above water, below water kind of a stratification. I do that a lot in my work, actually. I have these registers of um, activity that are kind of hierarchical, um, but in this one, there is a tiny ore. So, there was something here once, and its its absence is the thing that um, that becomes you know important. Plus, it feels really good. The bottom of this thing, I carved like crazy. It was a, t a technical exercise too to see like just how smooth and curved I could make something. So um, one of the things that I use a lot are vintage kimono fabrics. I really like them for their uh, graphic quality and the fact that they they suggest something without necessarily be, being you know explicit about it. 
Um, in this case, these are intended to be waves. And it just had this kind of wonderful cold impression that was left behind. But I wanted to, to fill it out a little bit further. And so the question is, how do you work with a, a material that has its own history and has its own visual qualities while still bringing your own voice to it? Because if I just took the kimono fabric and left it like that, I don't know that it would necessarily work. So what I did is I took the, the fabric that was on either end. Lots of these kimono obi have areas that are embroidered and then areas that are blank um, because they're you know part of what is being wrapped around and don't need to be seen. So I took those blank sections and cut them into these discs and then dyed the edges and then starched them and then stacked them to give this kind of dimensional cloud quality. Um, but that directly references this concentric wave pattern that's already present there. All right, so these are two pieces that I hadn't originally designed together. Um, this piece here is part of a series um, called If Then, uh, which deals, <laughs> deals directly with death and how we try to make sense of uh, sense of situations that happen that have no um, no framework necessarily within our own culture. Um, it's a bad explanation. I will do a better job in a minute. Uh, but this guy, for example. Okay, so this this piece is called Peony, like the flower. Um, Portrait of the Artist at 17. One of the things that I do a lot of um, within these pieces, when I, when I integrate fabric, and kimono fabric in particular, if it's orange kimono fabric, it's me. It's not a conscious choice necessarily, but I've found that when I make things and I involve things that are this color, it's, it's me. I'm making a piece about myself. I think that's partly because I used to dye my hair a very dark red for a very long time, and I associate bright oranges with myself. So I, I used a number of, of fabrics that were kind of my favorites. I've been collecting kimono fabric since I was in my 20s. I mean, so well over 20 years now, and it takes a really special piece for me to actually want to bring something out of the collection and use it. It's, it's been very difficult to bring myself to actually take these things and cut them apart and use them um, unless a piece really specifically calls for it. This really called for it. This was, this was, I wanted to convey something about how beautiful I found being young um, and how easy it was it, to a certain extent to be a young person because my life really was happening a lot on the surface. Um, so this is a polster. It doesn't actually open. It is just a solid upholstered form that is concerned with its exterior and being lovely and providing happiness to people who look on it. I like it next to this piece, or I've, I've positioned it next to this piece. This piece is called Graft. And as I was saying, it's part of the If Then series. I'm interested in natural history. I'm, that's probably putting it mildly. I'm kind of obsessed with natural history. I think most artists are natural historians to a certain extent. We all have weird collections. We all, you know, display them strangely. I have a box of skulls in my living room. I mean, we're weird people. Um, when I'm working with wood, I'm almost always working with a material that has been altered. It's been cut down, it's been dimensioned to a certain extent, and then it's been cured. And then from there, I am supposed to manipulate it further and take it even farther away from what it once was. Um, yet the artifact quality of the material is really, really interesting to me. Finding branches, finding little parts of things. Um, and so I made this piece as part of the series, as a way of talking about my feelings about other people's responses to my father's death. My dad died in 2013 from a, a really rare and aggressive form of cancer. And he was young, he was 62, and had been sick for four years. And 
the number of people who said to me, well, it's just not fair. Oh, it's so unfair. Or why did it have to happen to somebody who was so nice? And all I could think was, that fair has nothing to do with it. It's not that I'm angry about it. To be honest, I'm not. It, but it's interesting to me that other people's responses were, oh, well, we've got to find a, a way to make it make sense. And so I'm taking things that I think have meaning and I'm contextualizing them in a certain way so that this horrible thing that happened has meaning or has significance. And invariably, the way that people talked about all of this served their own self. You know, they wanted a thing, and so that's how they would contextualize it to, to give it meaning. And that's fine. People can do that. But I think it's interesting how far divorced we've become from our experience of death to the point that we have to give it meaning instead of recognizing it as an extension of life. So what I've done with this series of work, with the If Then series, is taken these artifacts from, from the natural world and try to recontextualize them in a way that gives them meaning. So reconstructing them within a, a, a natural history kind of context. Since natural history cabinets were a way for people to understand the world around them. Um, using that same format as a way of trying to understand what's going on. So graft here is two pieces of one kind of wood stuck to another one as a, as a, as a reconstruction, as a way of rebuilding it that isn't even remotely accurate. These two, this is maple and this is not. I think this is sweet gum. So this has its overarching arm. It's sort of, for me, it's a little bit like me and my dad. Um, so this is the first piece that I made in the If Then series. It's called Passage. It is very literally a passage. You can see something is moving through. But I like that passage, the word passage has multiple meanings. Partly that, yes, it's a path. It's, it's, a, it's a route that you can take. A passage is also a section of text. You know, it's just a small part that you're, that you're reading as opposed to the entire thing. It also means to, to die. So, the, you know, someone passes away. So this, for me, contains all of those things. Each one of these little pieces of, of wood is its own passage, its own small section of text. Um, and then it's literally passing through the center of it. When I made it, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> this was one of those things where I had no idea. I had no idea what I was making when I made it, but I just sort of let it happen and uh, didn't question it and didn't think too hard about it. And I'm glad that that was the case because it, all, the, all of this other work kind of followed from it. For myself, at least, when I'm making work, I do better by making without questioning and then going back and looking at it afterwards and saying, oh, okay, that's what that was about. That's why I was doing this thing. For me, it's not one of those things necessarily where I've, I've got a, a goal or a, a grand overarching theme that I'm working with that I'm conscious of. I mean, it's certainly that it's there, but it's not something that it is in the forefront of my mind as I'm making. Um, it's more that it reveals itself after the fact. Um, and that's what this did. It said, hey, do you want to make some more work like this? <laughs> and so I did. Um, so this piece is called Egg. It's called that because it reminded me of Cadbury Cream Egg when I, when I was making it. It was very white on the outside, very orange on the inside. At the time, I didn't know that eggs were actually that color. And that <laughs> when you get your eggs from a farm, they actually look like that as opposed to from a supermarket. This was the first piece, though, where it, I became really conscious that the orange interior was a self-portrait. I revisited this piece fairly recently and done a little bit of additional work on it. I've played up how much it's aged. I originally built it in 2007, which was shortly after I finished grad school. And I was still learning how to build things at that point. This was the largest thing I had ever made at, at that juncture and certainly the most complicated. And it has, it has its strengths and it has some drawbacks. 
And it reminds me very specifically of me now. So this 2020 version is self-portrait of the artist as a middle-aged lady. The outside scene a little bit of, seen some wear, <laughs> has a little bit of life experience and is more concerned with making sure everything on the inside is okay. So this piece is called The Fraud, Living Up to History. I initially made this as a, a contribution to a group show called Your Personal Hangups, which I think had been conceived of as a show for hangers, but everyone who had been accepted into it, it, it interpreted it as a show about your own kind of personal hangups. And at the time, mine was being a woodworker of enough quality that I was able to kind of play with the big kids. I was, this was right around the same time that my dad was getting sick, or no, this was 2012, he was already sick. And I, most of my energy was being spent going back and forth to Wisconsin from Philadelphia where I was teaching and taking care of him. And it, I, I really put my career on hold for a number of years and I don't regret that, but it did cost me a lot of momentum. And so I was trying to figure out what I was going to make for this show and was at the Chase Museum in Madison uh, looking at historical furniture. And there was some really beautiful Rococo work there that I was ogling. And I said to myself, you know, man, I'm never going to be able to make anything like that. No matter how long I work, how hard I try. I mean, maybe I could draw something like that, but, but yeah. hey. And so that's exactly what I did. So this is a fake in, in sort of every sense of the word. It's not really a mirror. It's just silver leaf. It's not really a rococo frame it's a picture of a rococo frame so it, it it's got that platonic ideal happening here of what it could be versus what it actually is so it still operates it's a table but it's not this table other than it's the image of this table i don't even know what to say about this piece because it's brand new it is absolutely brand new it doesn't even have a title yet <laughs> I can tell you what I was thinking about though while I was working on it. So I was thinking about a couple of different things. One has to do with privilege and how depending on your positioning, your perception of a situation is going to be a particular way, especially in light of everything that's been going on in the world right now. Um, I get very frustrated listening to people who have no idea about the reality that other people are living, talking about how people should be doing things or shouldn't be doing things, and not recognizing their own privilege at all. Because I think if they did, they would have a little bit of sympathy. I, at least I hope they would. Or maybe an appreciation for why change needs to happen in our society. So when I first thought of this piece, I was thinking that what was happening up here is much more idealized and, and peaceful. Everything above the water is calm and fine. And, the, and this boat is sound and seaworthy and not going to sink necessarily. And then there's what's below the water and what is the reality that many other people are living in, which is that their boats are made of paper if they exist at all. They're not something that can be depended upon to, to get you where the, you need to be. Plus, below the water here, it's churning. It's not quiet. It's not tranquil. It's just chaos. It also, the other thing I was thinking about while I was making it was that you have to try again and again and again to get something right. And so these also feel very much like practice iterations of something that becomes permanent. But that's more, that was more a, a, the practice of making this as opposed to the emotional and, and intellectual side of creation. And I'm really proud of how the, how the, how the moon turned out. That is a mother of pearl button. Um, the inside of the area, that cove is painted with black 3.0, which is just 
really as matte black as you can get without getting Vanta black. Um, and then it's graphite over that. And it has just enough luminosity because of that contrast to really kind of pop out at you.